The Crypt Interviews, in association with Mayo Legend Point Castle Bar. You're listening to The Crypt, and my special guest on the show today is puppeteer Mark Brian Wilson. Some of Mark's best-known work include Slimer and Ghostbusters, Harry the Shrunken Headed Hunter and Beetlejuice, and in Honey I Shrunk the Kids and The Vampires, Disintegration and Fright Night, to name but a few. So you're very welcome to the show, Mark. Well, thank you very much. It's nice to talk to you, Rita. It's a real pleasure to have you on. Um, well, as always in my interviews, I'm going right back to the start. So puppeteering was a passion of yours from childhood. What was it that made you first fall in love with it? Well, actually, I was about five years old and at my uh, school, there was a marionette show or a string puppet show. Mm-hmm. And uh, we saw Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, and it was a proscenium show. It was lit, and there was a soundtrack and everything. And at five years old, this was this was really magic. Yeah. And so I was enthralled as the show was performed. Uh, but the big thing that really clinched it for me is at the end of it, they allowed all of us children to go behind the stage and see the puppets, which were not being performed. They were all hung on a rack, and all the props were set next to them. So when we went back, I saw Snow White dressed in two different outfits, two different Snow Whites. It was mm-hmm. like, well, this is, you know, how, how does this all fit together? And then I saw some of the props, which had things that I knew I could buy at my local craft store. So I immediately got my mom to take me to the craft store and buy some jewels so I could make a jeweled cart for the seven dwarves. And so uh, I was uh, just enthralled at a very early age. And then from there, I just started getting books, learning how to do it myself, you know, even at age five to, you know, how, how do you yeah. make a head? How do you make? And those books were available at my local, uh, actually at the school library. So they were geared towards children and uh, I got started. It was just, you know, one step at a time. When then did you get your first job in the area of pop sharing? Um, I was probably, uh, actually, I belonged to uh, a social group at that point. I was part of a church group. And they wanted to produce some shows which uh, taught Bible stories from a current perspective. So that was my first kind of chance to uh, show to an audience. Uh, My first uh, pay work was through a local amusement park. Mm -hmm. Uh, They found out that I could build puppets and they wanted to put a puppet show in. Uh, This was uh, Six Flags Magic Mountain in Valencia, California. Uh, So I started there shortly after high school. And uh, I had a little bit of information and knowledge because I had built some uh, marionettes uh, for my high school art projects uh, for art fair so people could come see the uh, the art that the high school students were doing. Mm-hmm. And I took a couple of awards, so I got some pats on the back. Uh, okay. But then I, uh, when I had those puppets photographed, I was able to take them and start looking for uh, work. And uh, I luckily landed that job and was there for three years as a performer. Uh, I was both a a street performer, so I would wear a puppet stage over my shoulders, kind of like a tent, on a backpack frame. And then I would uh, walk around Magic Mountain and entertain people and tell them where the rides were. Or if a new ride had been put in, a lot of times the lines were just, you know, two hours, three hours long to get on a new roller coaster. Uh, So I did what was called line relief. So I'd walk up and down and kid with the people. And uh, I did a character called Dr. Blue Nose, which was a hand puppet, kind of like a Muppet style puppet. And so he would kid with the kids and uh, shake hands with everybody and uh, try to entertain and kind of make them feel entertained instead of, oh, it's two more hours until I can get on the road. It sounds like a real fun job. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Of course, I was with a lot of people about my own age, uh, from the ride operators to the entertainment. So as a about a 20 year old young person i was just surrounded by uh like-minded people and uh, it was just a great place to go and i could hang out after work and go ride the roller coaster so excellent oh i would love that (laughs) yes yes indeed but a lot of fun well your career has spanned over 30 years so i'm going to talk about some of the projects you've worked on the first being michael jackson's thriller video can you tell us your role there uh, yeah, first of all, we were uh, there was about 10 of us, if I remember right, who worked for Rick Baker, and he was in charge of the makeups. <clears throat> he had worked for uh, John Landis before, and uh, John was the director for Michael Jackson's Thriller. So uh, Rick had just gotten back to America. I believe he had been shooting Greystoke the previous year, building the stuff in London, and uh, then he had come back to America and was starting to put a larger crew together. Uh, I had worked with a friend of his, Doug Baswick, and uh, Doug recommended me to Rick. Mm-hmm. So uh, Rick said, well, let me see your portfolio, and I showed him what I could do. So, okay, you know, I think we have a job for you. 
Uh, so the first thing we did was actually to fabricate a lot of the stuff uh, for the dancers yeah. and for all of the zombies. I think there was 20 or 30 characters that had to be uh, zombified mm -hmm. and uh, turned into characters. Uh, so uh, my main job was to create hands uh, so that after the makeup was applied to the actors on set, which took a couple of hours, uh, then I was able to just slip the hands right on. They were... Uh, spandex gloves, but then they were clubbered with rubber and fake bones and stuff. Uh, so that was the first main part of the project. Uh, luckily, we got to do cameos also in the rock video, uh, so we got to create our own makeups. Oh, excellent. Uh, so of course, Rick uh, looked over the designs and made sure that uh, you know he was pleased with them, but we kind of got to do our own thing in a way. And uh, even though I'm in the video, I'm kind of in the background walking around, uh, uh, lumbering along the railroad tracks mm -hmm. and if you look in the uh, theater when Michael Jackson and Ola Ray get up to leave because uh, she's just too frightened you can actually see my eyewear or my spectacles in the back row I'm one of the audience members uh, so it was a real treat Excellent. you know it was quite a rarity to be able to uh, both make and then perform exactly. in a video and, and such an iconic piece I mean we knew it was going to be great because Michael was was really popular uh, those years and to get to do kind of what we thought was the new take on zombies of course they've been reinvented since but uh, that was kind of the state state of the art for uh, foam latex makeups and uh, performance it's and, such a uh, massive part of history it must just feel amazing to know you were yes. part of that yes it, it really is i mean and still that's one of those things when i say well you know i worked on you know michael jackson's thriller people you know their eyes light up and they oh tell me more you know? oh god yeah so exciting, it's fantastic. In 1984 then, you were part of the Creature Effects crew for Ghostbusters. How did that job come about? Well, uh, that one I ended up uh, getting pulled in by Steve Johnson. Uh, Steve had been one of Rick's uh, key artists on uh, Werewolf in London and some other projects that Rick mm -hmm. had started, including, uh, I mean, Greystoke and some other stuff. Uh, Steve was going out on his own. He had uh, decided, and I think it was mutual between him and Rick, that Steve had the talent and the drive and the push to go and uh, go out on his own. So uh, Steve Johnson and Randa William Cook were the artistic leads in the Creature Shop. Uh, so I took my portfolio, and I had met Steve uh, before through a mutual friend and was able to show him what I could do. Uh, Steve was actually working on a... Uh, a corpse body that he was trying to get cast up and even though I just barely knew him I could see the problem that he was having and he was kind of perplexed that he couldn't get the mold to fill so I said hey Steve how about if you drill some holes here and inject the foam into the arms first then into the legs then fill the body oh what a great idea well that was kind of the key that let Steve know that I could actually solve problems yeah and I could see things from different perspectives and I had a crafter sense and some talent so it was probably a couple of months after that that uh, I was called down to the uh, ghost shop. There was only a few people working there at that point. And so they looked at my portfolio and said, well, okay, yeah, we'd like to bring you in and uh, you know, go ahead and you can start next week. And we're going to be building a big crew and we've got a lot to do in a very short amount of time. And would you like to work on the Marshmallow Man? I said, great, I'll be in and I'll work on the Marshmallow Man. Well, the very next person who was interviewed was William Bryan. And uh, Billy has an amazing portfolio filled with all kinds of fabrication and foam construction and all that. So Billy ended up actually building the Marshmallow Man. And when I showed up, they said, well, we thought we were going to have you do the Marshmallow Man, but we're going to have you start in the librarian. So I ended up starting some sculptures for the librarian. And uh, that's kind of how I got started. It was some very simple sculptures. Um, but once I was in the building, I kept reminding them that I did have performance talent and I had been on a TV series at that point. Mm -hmm. And so I just kept kind of saying, hey, you know, maybe I could perform some of these characters. Maybe I could be in Slimer. Oh, no, 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 we have somebody else already. So when it started out, I was uh, doing some sculpting and fabrication uh, between the librarian, the terror dogs, and Slimer was my main role as a fabricator. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I ended up getting to perform some of the terror dog shots, uh, all of the uh, Slimer stuff, and then pull the cables on the librarian transformation figure. So it turned out to be uh, one of those jobs where you thought, oh, I'm not going to get to do the really cool thing. And I ended up doing three times as much as I thought yeah. it was going. It was really awesome how it all turned out for you. So it was. Yes. And like, 
When you were shooting the Slimer scenes, Bill Murray wasn't actually there on set when you were doing those scenes. So could you just explain how those scenes were shot? What happens is, you know, it's all storyboarded out so that everybody knows where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, so we knew what the shots looked like, where Bill would be in the same shot or if I was in the shot alone as Slimer. And so uh, discussions begin to happen about what shots are plate shots, um, should they need a shot of just the hallway with a cart in it or should they need uh, a long shot down the hall that they're going to animate something in and then uh, production on first unit would actually shoot the actors with the knowledge of where uh, the character was going to fit in so they could compose their shots you know, leaving enough elbow room that Slimer could do his business and uh, by the time we shot our Slimer takes then uh, we already had the bits of film with uh, Bill Murray in it or Dan Aykroyd, you know, shooting the ray gun down the, uh, the hallway. And uh, so it was a chance to look at that stuff. We would review it. We would talk about it. Uh, but then the uh, director of photography would actually take a single uh, frame and stick that into the third, or I think we're 65 millimeter cameras at that point mm -hmm. for the effects. And then he could look through the eyepiece and say, okay, Mark, move a little bit to the left. Don't move your arms as big because you're going to cross. Okay, we need to pull the camera back. We need to push it forward. And uh, then we would shoot our part. And so now what they would have is two pieces of film, one with Slimer, and I was shot against black uh, because I was not actually cut out. I was supposed to be translucent. Uh, so the black was uh, sufficient enough for the type of matting and stuff they needed to do. And then they would composite those shots. And sometimes we'd review them and uh, they would do a rough composite. And then we would either go back and do another take or uh, the director would say, no, no, that's that's the one I want. I will buy that shot and use it. But it uh, gave us a chance to kind of evolve the character. Yeah. Of course, you know, for each of my takes, I would do, you know, 10 takes. And then they would try to find that one little bit where Slimer is throwing the plate up over his head just right. God, um, so that much one, work, isn't there? There's so much yeah. work for Lots, lots and lots of, you know, conversations and uh, scratching your head to try to figure out a solution. A lot of the people I was working with uh, there had, you know, 20 years already in film effects and how to get the cameras to do what they needed to do and how the chemical processes yeah. could be evolved. Another a trick that people may not know is in order to make Slimer fly, since I had puppeteers attached to cables hanging out the back, was uh, that we did not move Slimer, we actually dollied the camera in. Oh. So if it looks like Slimer's flying right at the camera, that's me miming the arm movement, but the camera is tracking in. So they'd say go and oh. I'd start acting and then the camera would push in on me. And then that of course kept all the other puppeteers from having to run alongside yeah. or whatever. Uh, but it's a lot of performing in space instead of actually saying, okay, I'm running along, I'm running along, and you get that uh, actual body feeling you know by the movement you have to do it in place and then i i absolutely loved the librarian ghost is it hard designing something when you really have to make sure you get that shock factor when she turns from just a little old lady um, again it was you know a lot of problem solving uh, steve johnson had done some transformation puppets before so he knew about you know how to stretch foam latex and how to get things to uh, appear to transform in front of your very eyes um, we kind of knew where she needed to go, you know, what the end look was. Yeah. Uh, so Steve and I would work side by side and he was like, ah, you know, the face is not long enough. You know, we need to pull it down and, and you know, get the eyes to pull in deeper. Uh, so I built a, a pretty elaborate mock-up to start with out of a plastic pipe and wooden sticks and some screws and hot glue and, and put something together that Steve could then approve. And once that mock-up was approved, it was sent to the uh, the mechanics who did most of it out of wood. It's you know simple uh, hardwood, uh, little pulleys and uh, tracking things and hinges. Uh, once they gave that to me, then it was my job to pull the rubber skin onto this mechanism, which did everything that we wanted to do. You know, the neck lowered down, the uh, teeth pushed out, the eyes pulled in, the cranium dropped down. So then I took all the cables and attached them to their control devices in such a way that when we had four big triggers, I pulled two and Steve pulled two, that it caused all of those animations to happen simultaneously. You know, with a little slight delay here and a slight 
delay there, we could get her arms to come down just a little slower or the head to push down. Uh, but we had like five or six functions attached to each one of those handles. Uh, and then there was people blowing air and people uh, uh, pulling off the fabric with monofilaments. Uh, so it's you know, it's a more prep, you know, months mm-hmm. of building and fabrication for, I think it might be 24 seconds or something. But just, you know, it's a lot of problem solving, you know. Uh, I would look at an area and say, well, you know, I like what this is doing here, but it's not doing it over there. We want to, shall we say, see the ribs when they pushed forward. Uh, so I had to devise a system with little buttons that I would glue inside of the skin. And then when the ribs would push up against that, the string would remain in place. And then those uh, creases would then uh, show up in the lighting and stuff. So it's all very, very quick, but uh, kind of self the acting, you know, it wasn't like a push button, but it was uh, it was very involved, you know, in how you do that. And literally, you know, probably hundreds, if not thousands of decisions I had to figure out how to solve, you know, a simple problem. Okay. And so it's just one problem at a time, just one step, you know, that gets glued here, this gets cut off there, oop, that works, that doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> it, it gets evolved. Yeah. And then what? what's your opinion of the whole all-female cast for the reboot? Oh, that sounds great. Oh, thank um, God. The, thank God somebody who has said that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, you know, again, we're, you know, in a, a, a fanciful universe and, you know, we're all heroes and there's no reason to exclude anybody. Yeah. And, uh, you know, hopefully someday there will be the children's Ghostbusters where they save us all too. So. Well, this is what I was saying online because so many people are giving out about it. And I said, wait till you see it and give it a chance. If you watch it and it's crap, then give out about it. But don't <laughs> slate it till you've seen it. Yeah, and you know why? Why an all male cast? It's just because that's the way the first one was made. Eh, not not a good enough reason. You know? Yeah, exactly. Well, then you've also worked on one of my favorite horrors of all time, Fright Night. Okay. So, can you talk about your creation in that movie? Okay, so that was our uh, second uh, project in the Creature Shop at Boss Films, and uh, I don't even think I was off maybe a month before they called me back and said, "Hey, we got another one. Come on in. Excellent. We'd like to work some of the transformations and stuff." And so again, I was working for Steve Johnson and Randall William Cook, and uh, <clears throat> I had, you know, again some kind of effects. There were some puppets to be uh, consulted on and fabricated. Um, I'm trying to think what the first thing I did on Fright Night. Uh, I'm not sure the first thing. Probably the longest project I did was the Vampire Bat Wings. Needed a way to figure out to make them so that when they were front lit, they were plain brown. And when they were backlit, you could see through them. So when a light passes through the wings, we could all see the veins and uh, how they were put together. So that was uh, several weeks, if not even a month, making different types of wings of different patterns and different techniques to show Randy and Steve to see if any of these were going to be acceptable. And I also assisted on uh, putting those on to the bat puppet, which Randy had made, uh, in order to have a full bat, and I think he ended up having an eight-foot wingspan uh, and, and being a hand puppet. So, you know, a lot of kind of figuring things out. Yeah. Again, you know, it's kind of, I'm, I'm like, as a puppet builder, kind of a problem solver. And uh, let me see, the other thing I did on there was uh, Billy's disintegrating hands, I think Billy Bones. Yeah. He pulls his hands up in front of his face, and then they all melt and drip apart. So... You know, I had to uh, sculpt some interior hands, and uh, those were actually worn by uh, smaller women. Uh, the actor, uh, Mr. Stark, who played the character is you know, like 6'2", six 6'4", six or something like that. So we took some women who were uh, five feet, barely, and had very tiny hands, and then I sculpted the interior hands over their hands. And I think we used both of their right hands so that you see... In the effect, one hand kind of bends forward and the other folds backwards. So I took life casts of their hands and then uh, created the under stuff, all the bones and sinew and uh, muscles and tissue and stuff. And then I took another mold on that and then I sculpted ones that resembled the actor and those were cast in foam latex. So when that effect actually happens, it's two or three different things happening where there's monofilament, which begins to loosen up the foam latex, and it begins to peel as other people are pumping in green and yellow goo, so it would be oozing around the corners as the hands were dripping and, and coming apart. You know, it's fantastic to hear about how all these things were done. I just love practical special effects. Yeah, yeah I love of it. course, I, I do too, being a, a, a puppeteer, puppet maker, that's 
you know, what I've always liked to do is, you know, well, how, how can that happen? And how can I cut yeah. this up and turn it into that? You know, is it an old dish rag? Is it a, you know, do you have to go to the fabric store or the hardware store? And just finding those solutions. Do you know they're making a documentary about Fright Night? I've heard it and there's been several that have come and gone. So, I mean, that's very exciting. It's, you know. It's, yeah, these guys are good. fantastic that are doing a Dead Man's Productions. They just did one on Hellraiser. Okay. So I'd say this would be a good one. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Um, you also worked on Poltergeist 2. Yeah, Poltergeist 2. So what I want to ask you here now is, this whole thing that those they reckon the Poltergeist movies were cursed, what's your opinion on that? Well, so far it's been good for me, so I guess it... Uh, Nothing's not, happened to you yet. <laughs> not on what has passed me by. <laughs> um... Now, I could be here all day going through all the movies you've worked on. <laughs> so many movies I loved as a child. It's just fantastic. But the last one I have to mention is Daffy and Gremlins 2. He must have been so much fun to work on because he was daft as a brush. Yeah, that was just a real a real lot of fun. Um, on that pro- project, I actually did not build. I was hired as a performer. And to be handed puppets that were made by Rick Baker's Innovation and just the top of the line, most beautiful foam latex puppets. Yeah. The beautifully finished and detailed and to be handed something that was so gorgeous and to say, okay, now bring it to life. Um, I th- just was, uh, was a real thrill. Um, we worked, I think, three months shooting that. And I think they even gave us a month up front to rehearse, which is very rare. Usually the puppets aren't done until the camera rolls and uh, the paint is still drying as they're saying, okay, roll action, you know. Yeah. So very exciting. The puppets were just, just super. Also got to work on that, uh, helping to coordinate the spider gremlin uh, where he's uh, going after gizmo in the cobwebs and stuff. So. Oh, cool. a, a little bit of uh, not really second unit directing, but helping to bring another character to life that was puppeteered by other pup performers. Oh, I love Gremlins. They're awesome. Yeah, and so fun to be able to take him through a Mogwai up through a Gremlin. And also I uh, did the radio control on Gizmo for his face and uh, oh. earwigs and stuff. There's kind of a core group of about uh, five or six of us lead puppeteers. And so when one of the other lead characters was on then we would assist on that character in the past you've said ghostbusters was your favorite movie to work on so leaving that off the list what would be next in line oh goodness um it's really hard to ble- beat that one um I think so. <laughs> you know I, I think you know a thriller uh, was probably the the second favorite mm. what makes them so uh, memorable in my mind is to work with a group of people very similar in age and uh, talent coming up in the industry. Uh, It was lively and fun. Uh, It was more silly than work, you know, even though we definitely uh, brought our A game, uh, there was just a lot of levity and some, you know, very fun and comedic uh, afternoons and days uh, trying to get everything done in time. You know, it's it's a lot of pressure, but uh, those those projects where uh, you're, you know, just it's almost like hanging out on the schoolyard or whatever yeah. uh, at a recess you know it's uh, it's just fun and lively and uh, very fortunate to have enjoyed such great uh, projects with some you know, just amazing people who have all gone on to to great heights and of all your creations did you ever get to keep any of them for your own personal collection uh, most of that stuff is owned by production yeah. i actually have uh, some things like mock-ups and stuff yeah I have the librarian mock-up eyeballs. We uh, created the four uh, color schemes because she was supposed to actually go into another transformation. Uh, which, after they saw the first part of it, they said, "No, nope, yeah, let's you know, let's not go any farther. This is what we need for our first scare." Um, so I have uh, those eyeballs, which are look like little round doorknobs, which I painted the different color schemes. Okay. And uh, actually, uh, when the tower on Ghostbusters blew up. Uh, which was a miniature, uh, those panels got scattered all over the parking lot uh, down in Marina Del Rey where they were shooting the stuff outside. And so I scurried around the parking lot and I still have a dozen or so pieces of the big temple doors from the Gozer's Temple, you know, all little two inches by three inch, you know, shrapnel pieces because those were headed into the dumpster. So, Gone. And now I bet you could put your kids through college 
10 times over <laughs> what they'd be worth to a fan now. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> And then you have an awesome website where people can go and check out your work. Yes, that's uh, www.markbrianwilson.com. And it's um, my name is M-A-R-K-B-R-Y-A-N-W-I-L-S-O-N. It's all one word. And you can go there and see uh, clips from videos, my demo reel, uh, where I'm going to be at conventions or whatever next. And uh, some uh, stills that you just won't see anyplace else. Excellent. And then you mentioned conventions there. You're coming to the UK in August, is it? Yes, August 1st and 2nd. I'm going to be in Taki and uh, a convention called Optimist Southwest Film and TV Convention. Okay. So there's going to be several of us from Ghostbusters, if you're a Ghostbusters fan at all. Oh, that'd be uh, awesome. I'm going to be there, but uh, Robin Shelby, who was Slimer in Ghostbusters 2, uh, Billy Bryan, who was the Marshmallow Man, and uh, Ernie Hudson also. And then there's a uh, bunch of other guests and stuff to come and see, get autographs. Excellent. They've got some uh, great workshops and stuff coming. I hear that uh, the Ardman folks might be giving a stop motion animation workshop and some other really cool stuff. So, you know, definitely go by uh, the Optimist Convention uh, website, which is www.optimusconventio.com. And I hope to meet somebody uh, and some people over there. Uh, if you're in Ireland, I don't know if it's too big of a skip and a jump, but mm -hmm. uh, come on over and say hi. I'd love to meet the fans. Excellent. Well, we actually, we had Ernie Hudson here last summer at Dublin Comic Con. He's a lovely man. So nice. Yes, he is. yes very, very talented and uh, very easy to talk to. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. It's been such a pleasure talking to you and so interesting to hear all the work behind all those practical special effects that we grew up with. Well, thank you, Rita. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and uh, it's always fun to share, you know, what an exciting career I've had.